Harrison in the spring of last year said, Do you, are you aware of the fact that there in the in the British Parliament there's an all-party committee that is uh, anxious to adopt land value capture? And I said, no, that sounds wonderful. And he said, well, they're going to be meeting uh, here in, uh, in London, and there's other groups that also have the same interest in land value capture. Um, so he asked if I could come, and I said, well, if you can find someone who will buy me the airfare, which is about $500, I'd be happy to come over. Uh, and he did find uh, a person that uh, was willing to do that. What happened to Dan? He disappeared. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, there you uh, go. So, so the, 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 the person who funded the trip, interesting enough, was um, a reverend. A reverend who is not only a, a preacher, but he uh, was the head of a group called um, Taxpayers Against Poverty. So that was that was the uh, the start of my trip, and I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, the trip and giving some examples that I used uh, when I was in uh, Great Britain. Um, let's go to the, the next slide. So the two, the two major groups that I was involved with was the all-party parliamentary group for land value capture and then the moral case, case campaign for affordable housing. But along the way, I had a chance to meet with uh, party members of all the parties uh, in uh, Great Britain and uh, had a chance to meet with various other groups. We'll go to the next slide. This is a list of the... Um, of the of the of the members of Parliament and the House of Lords that were part of this study group, and they had been meeting already for over a year, and you'll see that uh, each party is represented, and there is a vice chair from each of the major parties. So speaking with this group was a real opportunity. On the next slide, I I just merely had a picture of uh, Fred Harrison, who is the one who got me initially interested in this, standing in front of the uh, parliament buildings. And on the next slide, I'm showing the uh, Taxpayers Against Poverty, which is the group that actually funded the airfare for my going over. And Reverend Paul Nicholson was the primary person uh, who brought me over and was took care of me while I was there. Um, it wound up being a wonderful time because I took uh, Tony along with me and we turned it in, into a vacation. And we had a chance to see a lot of the things in the uh, London area. So on the next slide um, is one of, the so one of the social groups. And what, what is happening in Great Britain is that um, much of the housing is publicly owned, owned by council groups and so forth. And... Um, What's unfortunate is that the council tax was set up uh, over 25 years ago at what was existing rates at that time. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, those rates have not been changed. And just like a frozen assessment roll here, um, the values have gone up. And the rates were not like what the value was for each property. It was like groups, like eight different groups. So if you had a residential unit that was uh, uh, valued at less than um, uh, 100,000, you'd be in another one group, or from 100 to 200, you'd be in a second group, and so forth. And the highest group was about a million. Well, back 25 years ago, there weren't that many properties in the million category, but today uh, it makes up a, a, a majority of the properties in London that are in that category. So everybody, is opposed to the council tax. There's no one that speaks in favor of it, really, that I'm aware of uh, in Great Britain. Uh, they want to find an alternative. And what was interesting about this, this uh, parliamentary group 
is that they had really come to the idea of adopting a land value tax as the best solution. Um, and uh, at, in addition to the residential council tax, which is a problem, there was also the commercial business rates and the stamp tax duties. And they thought that it would be good just to get rid of all these at the same time. And on the next slide, what I, what I found out is that um, all the groups that I spoke with had similar questions. The first one was, can land be valued separate from improvements? And of course, that's easy to answer because it's very simple to value land separate from improvements. And it is done pretty much universally in the United States and in most of the Commonwealth countries already. Uh, second was, what costs and time is required to introduce a land value tax? And there again, it can be done virtually instantly uh, if you had that as your, of your objective, or it could be done in various other ways according to what, the, uh, what was desired. And the third question was, who would be hurt by the shifting taxes from buildings to land? And that's also very easy to answer. I think we all know that answer. And then, uh, is land rent adequate to fund public purposes? And that was, I spent a lot of time on that last question because I feel uh, like it is. On the next slide, um, <coughs> half of England is uh, owned by less than 1% of the land. I was sitting next uh, to Bill Batt, who said, take this book up. This is a wonderful book on who owns England. And uh, talk to Bill about it. Uh, he's, I think, read it already. And uh, it, it kind of comes to the same conclusion, I believe, that 1% of the population owns most of the land in uh, England. Um, 25,000 landowners, typically members of the, uh, the aristic aristocrats and the corporations have the control of the country. Now the next slide. That is the author of the book in your hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, all right. What I was, what I was glad to find out is that, while not all the parties had come to the conclusion that they should um, immediately adopt a land value tax, there was at least one party, uh, the Labour Party, that was making that part of their parliamentary campaign. Now, uh, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that the uh, conservative government really has the power in England and is going to uh, you know, continue to dominate for some time, I believe. But at least the, parliament, the Labour government was willing to say that their, their goal was going to be to replace the council tax with a progressive property tax. And of interest there, what I underlined, to be paid by the owners, not the tenants. In the United States, of course, the owners pay the property tax, but in Great Britain, uh, the tenants pay the property tax. So you get a, a, a bill for, for your, your rent of the, uh, of the flat, and you also have to pay the property taxes on that. So their, theirs, their objective was to also do away with and have the tax fall on the um, the owners, and that they would replace a business tax with a land value tax based upon the rental value. This next next slide. Ah, okay. <clears throat> My own belief, of course, and what I was talking about to each of the groups that I spoke with is that land rent is the best source of public revenue. Land is a free gift of nature. Land rental value is an economic surplus that belongs to everyone and that land rent is adequate to fund public needs. The next slide. The other thing I like to point out is that today worldwide only a tiny amount 
of the value of land rent is currently being captured or collected. Even in the United States, it is so small. And I like to look back to at the turn of the, of the, the beginning of the 19th century, we were collecting a majority of our revenue from, from, from land and property taxes. And it's gone down and down and down to where now, uh, a century later, very, very little is being collected from land rent uh, and from starting, property taxes. Ted, you're starting 1800 when you say it's the beginning of the 19th century. Well, it could go back that far, yes. 1800s and, and, the, and 1900s. When did you say the uh, majority was collected? What, what, what year? Well, certainly at, at the time that Henry George was running for mayor in the late 1800s, uh, to look back at the st statistics, and I have a chart that I'll show you on Australia, uh, there that shows clearly uh, how much was uh, of the revenue came from land rent and from uh, property taxes. In, in House and Home, 1960, Gaffney said 50 years earlier, which would be 1910, mm -hmm. that land paid over half. Yeah. Of all taxes. Of all taxes. Of all taxes. Yeah. And that was. Yeah. Okay, on the next slide, um, <clears throat> the thrust of what I said is that it's possible to estimate the rental value of land, of all land, in the United Kingdom, and it could be done quickly, accurately, and at a reasonable cost. Next slide. What I found out in, uh, in London in particular was that they already had the records, and most places do have good records. Even in Russia, when I w was working there in, uh, in, in 1990, they did have assessment rolls, and they had records. And certainly, most places already have records existing. In the United Kingdom, they have pretty good records that were created by the Valuation Office Agency, which was the group that administers the um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the various bans for the council tax. And then there was the business rate taxes, and there was also a study in the European Union of methods for estimating land value. So let's go to the next slide. So the question comes up about, well, why did they ask me to come over? And, uh, very simply, British Columbia I, is where I had my greatest uh, opportunity to really do a good job of, of valuing land. British Columbia, of course, is a, um, is a province uh, that's very similar to the type of government that Britain has, and British Columbia is part of the, the uh, British Commonwealth. Uh, they knew it, that I had been the assessment commissioner who had basically uh, written the laws in British Columbia and um, the position was a simple, similar to being a deputy minister of finance, that I had also been a professor of real estate. So that was the introduction when I went to speak with the, with the groups. And they would pay attention to what I have to say, you know, because they saw that I did have some experience. Um, the next slide basically shows that British Columbia in terms of size is almost four times larger than the United Kingdom. And um, they thought, well, you know, if you can assess all the land in British Columbia, it, it certainly would be possible to do so in the United Kingdom. And on the next slide is just pointing out the major difference, of course, is population, uh, British Columbia. Uh, had uh, uh, less than 5 million people, whereas Great Britain has 55 million people. Um, next slide. This is Parliament buildings in British Columbia, and um, uh, I'm showing that basically just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Yeah, they do. They have a beautiful downtown if you've been to Victoria. It's a, it's a lovely city, one of the nicest cities, uh, I think, uh, anywhere. 
And the next slide. Um, so the BC, British Columbia government wanted to improve their property tax. They had had a frozen assessment roll for 30 years. Um, assessments had been very good in British Columbia, and there were uh, eight municipalities that had adopted a pure land value tax in British Columbia. But because of the assessment rolls that had been frozen for such a long period of time, um, the, the land values were just totally outdated and were nonsensical. And the BC government that was elected was an NDP government, which is kind of a more radical left-wing type government, but not that radical. And that they set a bunch, uh, set aside a whole bunch of different objectives, in terms of the ferry system and uh, uh, t uh, lowering the rates for the um, automobile drivers, which were the highest in the world at the time that they won their election. They wanted to improve the property tax, and they wanted to collect more from land and nat natural resources. And um, so they set aside. And I got an opportunity, because Mason Gaffney had just moved there a year earlier, um, and I uh, was in uh, working as the assessor in uh, uh, in um, Hartford, Connecticut at the time. But I was very unhappy with the fact that the government in um, Hartford was not anxious to adopt the land value tax that I was advocating. And I called Mason and I said, you know, I'm looking for a better opportunity. And he said, well, um, I don't know if there's a chance here in British Columbia, but at least they're open to looking at uh, opportunities that exist. So a few weeks later, I got an invitation to fly out to British Columbia and be interviewed by the premier. He said, well, we'll hire you for one year uh, on a contract to do a study of the pro property tax and to make recommendations about how to improve it. Um, that was in 1973. Okay. Yes. You only have four minutes and we'll give you another five. You okay. started five late. All right. But you have a lot of slides to get through. So. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna keep moving on. All right, so move, move on. Um, next slide, and the next slide, and one more slide. So here was the proposed objectives in British Columbia was to capture land rent as a plentiful source of public revenue, reduce the taxes on buildings, workers, homeowners, producers, merchants, and enhance the wealth of all people. And next slide. Uh, the British Columbia Assessment Authority has been in existence for 44 years, and it is considered to be the uh, premier assessment organization uh, anywhere. The next slide. Um, in British Columbia, $8 billion is collected in property tax, of which $4 billion, more than, more than half, is from land values. And next slide. So I'm going to give three examples very, very quickly, and I'm going to go through this real fast. The examples were California, Australia, and Harrisburg, and then relating it to England. And California, I'm going to go just very quickly on this, the next slide, is that um, uh, there was a study done and a proposal made to abandon Proposition 13 and replace it with a land value tax. And next slide. On that, they asked me to do a, um, a study of this, uh, and it, what I did the study, and it was presented to the um, uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the legislative analyst office. Next slide. British or California is uh, is about twice the size of the United Kingdom. Next slide. They jump backwards on me. Okay. Next slide. And in California, the result, and I'm just going to go over this. Go, go, next slide. Next one. And next one. In California, basically, um, we found out that the, all of the taxes that were leveled at the state level could be eliminated, including the state income tax, state property tax, state sales tax and replaced with a land value tax, or a land rental value tax, a land rent tax. 
And it would not only replace all the taxes, but it would give a surplus of value of about 20% uh, additional. So next slide. In Australia, um, there was some excellent work done. And the conclusion that they reached was that <clears throat> By studying the, um, uh, the domestic pro property, uh, uh, domestic product of the country, a 25% of gross annual domestic property would replace all taxes in, Aust in Australia. Next slide. Uh, before you, you know, that I sh this, this slide is very important. Many of you have seen this already. But if you look at the blue on the bottom, that's the amount of, of, of net income that goes to the people who produce the net income. And if you go to the, the uh, light red, that's the taxes that are not properly re property related that are paid. And the, the bright red are the land value taxes. And the top, the gray, is the uh, amount that remains in the hands of the property owners. And you can see at the, at the bottom, by 1911, you know, people, the, 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 there was a land value tax, and it got larger as time goes on, but so did all the other taxes get larger. And you can see that the amount that people kept uh, went, got to be smaller. Next slide. we am finishing just a couple slides here now. Harrisburg has a two-rate tax. They have a land tax that's six times higher than their building tax. Next slide. That's kind of an example. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide. So finally, I went then to Great Britain. And, and this is what I found out. The total gross domestic property or uh, product was about $2 trillion of which land at 25% would be a half a trillion. Next slide. And that by raising that revenue, they could abolish the council tax, the business tax rates, and the stamp duty. And the next slide. Um, this is the last slide I'm showing only because I, I like very much um, uh, Stiglitz. And what caught me, and the reason I had this in was I was talking to the the groups about poverty. And I thought that this slide kind of really hit the poverty issue uh, because he said uh, in this slide that much of the inequality in our system is a result of rent seeking. And rent seeking redistributes money from those at the bottom to those at the top. That's the final slide. So that's basically what I covered when I was in England. We only have time for maybe one or two questions at the most. Uh, if I could just get you to clarify something you said um, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that in the United Kingdom, the tenant pays the property tax instead of, instead of the landlord. Is that, in your view, is that just a matter of, is that somehow distorting the market? Is it simply more efficient to to collect the land rent directly from the landlord as opposed to the tenant? I mean, in theory, the t if the tenant has to pay more to the council directly, then he's paying less to the landlord. But, but mm -hmm. is, that, is that not what happens in practice? Yeah. Well, in, in essence, of course, the landlord is going to get the tenant to pay the, um, the taxes indirectly in the United States. The landlord is responsible for the tax, but he's uh, he realizes that in the land rent or in the rent that he's collecting, uh, he has to collect enough to pay the taxes. It's just I've only mentioned it because it is it is different uh, in Great Britain than it is in the United States. I thought it was kind of interesting to point out to people, and it surprised me. One more question, and then I think we're going to have to sign off. I want the second. 
My question is really very basic, and that is we blandly toss off the phrase of the land right to look after communities' needs. What are the communities' needs? Can you tell me? Because everything that we do now, uh, for the, uh, by way of uh, community purposes, increases the value mm -hmm. of the land, increases the rent. It's a, it's a cycle that I, I don't understand. Tell me, is there anybody that says this is what a community needs to live? And then we, we can take a, a fair assessment, will the rent cover that or not? We, this phrase, the community's needs, I, I'm not sure what that means. Well, the community needs are basically uh, the needs that people who live in the community want and need. Uh, and, and those are basically fire protection, police protection, schools. Um, no health care? Well, and it could be health care. I mean, that, that's a question that would be up. Certainly in many countries, health care is, in, is included. Um, so, you know, it, the needs of the community are dictated by the members of the community. And, and really what I'm saying is that um, there's enough revenue to be derived from land to take care of those needs. And even, even when new subdivisions are being built and so forth, all the roads and so forth are paid for by the developer uh, and then turned over to the city to manage. So I think that we, there, all I'm really saying is that there's plenty of revenue available for the needs that we have. Now, if you're interested in the book, please see Bill. Uh,